Hello, my friends. Welcome to worship once again, and grace and peace be with you all from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Join your hearts with me now as we pray our prayer for this Sunday, the third Sunday after the Epiphany. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Here's a beautiful song about, uh, among other things, the great works of the Lord that he does in our lives. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise In the city of our God, the holy place The joy of the whole earth Great is the Lord in whom we have the victory. He aids us against the enemy. We bow down on our knees. And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. And Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives, Lord, we trust in your unfailing love, for you alone are God eternal throughout earth and heaven above. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. In the city of our God, the holy place, the joy of the whole earth. Great is the Lord in whom we have the victory. He aids us against the enemy. We bow down on our knees And Lord, we want to lift your name on high Lord, we want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives Lord, we trust in your unfailing love For you alone are God eternal throughout earth and heaven above. Ah, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Continue to praise God and contemplate on His greatness uh, using Psalm 138 which I will read for us, and you have printed on your little sheet there, which I hope you have. I will give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart, and before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me, my strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is on high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, 
and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Well, we're going to have a very famous little scripture today, a story we all will recognize, and certainly is about one of the great works of the Lord that is well known to us all. And this is the famous story in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus performs the miracle of changing the water into wine. Uh, we're going to investigate this a little and see what, what it has to teach us today. Listen for the Word of God. On the third day there was a marriage <clears throat> in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine till now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I said, this is a famous little story. Um, and if you're like me, though, it has never quite, I've never quite known completely what to make of it. There's a few puzzles in here uh, that are always kind of you know, stuck with me a bit. For example, this little dialogue between Jesus and Mary, it has a kind of odd little tone to it, like woman, what are you talking about? Why are you, it has a sort of formality or even a, a little hint of disrespect in it, did you feel? Um, but then, of course, Mary is unfazed and seems to act in complete confidence that he will do exactly the right thing, whatever he chooses to do, whatever he may do, and tells the servants whatever he says do. What uh, is she given some insight, perhaps, by the Spirit to, into what he may do or whatever? That's just one little puzzle. We're not really, you know, given any insight into that whole thing. Also, it's why a wedding a wedding and it's all about wine and uh, people drinking freely and running out of wine and everything. Now, for many uh, people, uh, that's a little issue. Uh, obviously, a lot of people have an um, alcohol problem. They, there's uh, often people have moral or uh, spiritual reasons for abstaining from wine. What's Jesus? Why? Why choose this as a as a sign as a miracle? That's a another thing. So it's full of those little questions. Um, but I want to tell you that if we get too um, literal, what I've learned by this investigation this time is by getting too literal. That is insisting that we have to make rational sense of every little detail in here, we're liable to miss the broad meaning of the story and the purpose of the story. Uh, and John himself is very clear about what that is. Uh, uh, I'm going to just remind you, very verse 11, this, the first of his signs Jesus did at Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the point of the story, that Jesus' glory is revealed to his disciples, right? and they believe in him. This, too, 
reminds us that when we're dealing in the Gospel of John, we are um, dealing with the apostle who was very close and intimate to Jesus, who waited to write his gospel quite, quite a few years after the other three were already written. And his has a totally di different tone. It has many of the same elements of uh, the long passion narrative and Jesus teaching and performing miracles and doing various things, but there's a completely other tone in it and, and, and focus in it. And everything about it is geared toward that very same thing that is the glory of who Jesus is being revealed again and again to the people around him, especially his disciples. In, in verse um, 20, chapter 20, John is very explicit, in fact, about this entire thing and why he even wrote the gospel. He says this, Jesus did many other signs, we're gonna come back to that word, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is why John wrote the book. That from his experience and intimate knowledge of Jesus, he was able to share all these moments where his glory was revealed. And somehow, uh, that is what this odd little story is about, this, this, this wedding. I mean, let's face it, this is a kind of an everyday uh, event, a wedding. It's a wedding. It's, it's just a wedding, and it has to do with wine, right? It's, it's one of these parts of ordinary life in people's lives. Uh, and he just is there. He's just there with his mother and his disciples. He's part of the part of the wedding. Um, but that doesn't mean it, it's not unimportant to him and to the people involved there. You know, in a, in a any wedding that runs out of wine or runs out of food, that's going to be a terribly embarrassing um, and uh, disturbing event for the people involved. And in those days when hospitality, especially uh, to your neighbors, was such a high value, such a very, very high value, and the uh, um, uh, standing and responsibility of your family was very much at stake, to, to actually fail in this way and run out of wine is um, a serious matter. And so Jesus is present there, and he doesn't ignore it. He gets involved in it, and he engages in extends himself to help and his blessing, his grace that is extended is extravagant. Now remember here, six stone jars, 20 to 30 gallons, this all comes out calculated, I saw someone calculate this, to 900 bottles of wine. <laughs> 900, all right? I mean, this is, <laughs> I've been to weddings, but I don't think I've ever been to one where there was that much drinking going. So this is overabundance of grace flowing. Further than that, he takes, he takes what was originally meant to be for some religious ritual of the, of the Jews, some rite of purification, and transforms it into this work of grace just, just freely going out. And the other thing is, it's kind of hidden. It's only a few people know. It's, it's, it's not a big, uh, like the... Um, a big, uh, you know, earth-shaking event that, that the whole culture sees. Oh, my God, look at that miracle. No, no, it's just very quiet. The steward doesn't know. Just the servants seem to have some sense of what happened, but even they probably don't understand what happened. His disciples see it, they know. The rest of the people in the wedding are just happily drinking, all right? And it's hidden. It's hidden in that way. Uh, and the extravagance. Now, I think the point of the story can teach us that that is exactly the way God works in our lives. John calls these things signs. They are signs of his glory, and they are meant to support and nourish faith. They're meant to create and nourish faith. They don't have to be gigantic. They just have to be real, and they are in your life. And I think the point, one point of John's story that this has made me realize is how many of these little signs, hidden, quiet, God performs in all of our lives all the time. No, other people can't understand it, but we know, you know. 
in my own life, if I, could, if I think back on my whole life, and especially my Christian life, it has just been again and again and again. The hand of God was unmistakably at work in my life and the life of my family in a way that it was hidden to others. And I couldn't possibly, you know, demonstrate what God had done to others. I just knew. When I would tell it to a person of faith, they heard it immediately. I'll give you just one example, all right? I'm here as your chaplain now for five and a half, uh, five years, a little over five years. I wonder, how did this happen? How, where did this guy from New York come from? How, how, how did he get here? Um, well, through a series of, of uh, decisions, uh, when my, my family was up in New York, I knew I wanted to bring my ministry to a close and move further south. Would, somehow or other, we just settled on coming to a, a southern Delaware. We saw this house. We sort of fell in love with it. That, too, was a, a sort of act of God. We had no experience buying houses. We probably didn't even do it correctly, but we just somehow knew this was our house. And, uh, we, and, and through a, 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 an other, another series of kind of unlikely coincidences, the money to purchase the house suddenly came in, into being, uh, and we were able to get it. Um, then we moved down, and I don't have a clear plan about a, a job or anything like that. I fear we're going to work it out, and uh, we'll make it work somehow. But I had complete peace and confidence. Even though nothing was secure or settled, I, I just had complete certainty that it was going to be okay. So we spent a few months getting our house together, getting things together, and then I realized, well, I'm kind of ready to look for some come work of some sort. And, and I pray real fervently one morning and say, Lord, I'm ready to, I'm ready, Lord, I think, to, you know, find a little part-time job and maybe a part-time a pastor in a church or something and, 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 you know, have a little income and et cetera like this. That same day that I prayed that prayer, I get a call from the Methodist district in superintendent who I had contacted and let her know I was uh, available for pulpit supply and things like that. And she says, could you fill in at the manor house for a little while while they search for a new uh, chaplain. I'm like, what's the manor house? It's this and that. I said, yeah, I can do that. And I come and preach a couple Sundays. The next thing I know, I'm a candidate for the position. And within very quickly, I immediately got convicted that I loved this place and was very eager to get this position. And God made it clear, you are going to get this position, and this is why you moved down here. And there was no doubt about it, right, to me, to my wife. It was like a little miracle. When I interviewed for the job, my superior at the time, very godly man, a senior chaplain, and explained to him how I got there, he marveled and said, what a sovereign work of God. Immediately knew, you see. And so what God had done, this little hidden thing that nobody saw, right? Who cares about a little family moving from New York to, De to Delaware? It just it happens all the time. It's nobody sees it. Nobody's thinking. But, but we knew, see? His disciples knew that he was at work and he was taking care of his, his church and his people and he had plans for me and he had plans for you and he had plans for my wife. He had plans for all these things and he was moving his pieces the way he wanted to and we all saw it and we believed and we our faith and confidence in him increased. You see, this is a little Cana miracle that happened in my life and it's just one of many I could share with you. I'd like you to think about those things in your life today. Things that only you know, you know? Things that just you and your family know. Okay, sure, we would like it if, uh, I would definitely like it if uh, God would restore to me the strength of my uh, 
a youth th that I had 35 years ago or so. I'm sure I would love that. I would love him. I've pretty much accepted now he's not going to repair the kidney damage that I suffered uh, some years ago and have to cope with all the time. Uh, I'm, I realize he's not going to do that, but he sustains me as, as I go. You probably have your things too and you realize you've learned to live with them, but also you know he's there with you all the time through it, right? He's there with you all the time through it in those hidden little ways. Uh, what are they? What have they been? They've been little signs, see? Little signs for you. The way Jesus did this miracle there and his disciples believed in him. And Mary was convicted and confirmed. And at various times as John goes through, he does other things and the people around see and believe, you see. God is still at work. He's still at work. It might be at your dinner table. It might be, uh, you might be in the hospital. You might be walking around the hallway uh, at worship. If our ears and eyes of faith are open and we see and hear, we will see those signs and our faith too and confidence in him and the greatness of his works. Those works don't have to be earth-shaking works. They're great works in your life as we sang in the beginning the works you've done in our lives, you see. These are our little Cana moments in our lives. Let's give thanks to God that he continues to give us clear evidence of his presence with us, his intimate care of us, his extravagant grace flowing into our lives at all times and in all places. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we confess we are too apt to complain, wonder where you are, why you don't fix this, why you don't fix that. I confess I'm very prone to it myself, and I'm sure my brothers and sisters are likewise convicted by this. Instead, let this story teach us as your people to have eyes to look for you working in those quiet, hidden ways that the eyes of faith can see, and let allow you to reveal yourself and your glory to us in ways that perhaps we didn't expect it, but that will constantly confirm all the truth of your promises and your goodness and your extravagant grace towards us. Oh Lord, may our lives overflow with the wine of salvation and the joy of faith and hope and charity which have flowed from you. We ask all this through our Savior Jesus, who has taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I enjoyed telling you that little uh, episode of God's working in my life. Sometimes a little relation of a little story like that can <clears throat> encourage other believers and et cetera. And um, that too is something we can all do sometimes. And so here's a song to celebrate that, a wonderful uh, old classic, uh, class, classic um, hymn of worship. I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true, satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems, than all the 
golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story it did so much for me. And that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story tis pleasant to repeat. It seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song Twill be the old, old story That I have loved so long I love to tell the story Will be my theme in glory To tell the old, old story Of Jesus and His love Those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. So don't be shy about sharing your stories of Jesus' work in your lives, his great works in your lives, his Cana moments in your lives. And by that, encouraging and strengthening and nourishing the faith of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. This is our story today, the wedding at Cana, and our own little wedding at Cana moments in our lives. Grace and peace to you all, and may Almighty God bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift his countenance upon you, give you peace now and forever. Amen.